Hello and welcome to the Better Half Show. It's season three of the show and we've been looking at divorce, separation and remarriage. Now, a lot of marriages have gone through all kinds of situations this season uh, that have threatened the integrity of the union. The first question I'd love to pose to you today is what is the state of your union if you're married? What is the state of your union? If you're single, what is your emotional state towards the relationships and marriage? Uh, the pandemic, the lockdown, the shutdown, the economic meltdown has affected many homes to the point that many people are second guessing their readiness to get married as singles right now. And many married people are looking for a way to bail out of their marriage. Uh, that's why we're discussing separation, divorce, remarriage. And uh, I've been talking to people who have experienced either a separation or a divorce. We've been gleaning from their experiences, uh, the principles, the things they could do differently. And uh, that's why today I have uh, with me on the show, Andy Moyo. Uh, Andy is, uh, is uh, uh, an IT expert, he's a father of two, uh, and he's experienced uh, a separation, uh, a long one for that matter. Andy, you're welcome to the show. Thank you, PG. So um, just as a way of starting, how, how long were you married? Yes, so I was married for seven years. Seven years? Yes, sir. And um, how long have you been separated? I've been sep separated for about um, nine years now. About nine years? It's going on ten, yes. Going on ten. Wow, that's a long separation. Uh, so you, you, you've literally been single, for, single again for uh, almost ten years. Yes. And um, uh, you have two kids. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sure maybe they're like teenagers or, or so now. Yes, so I have a teenager and I have one that's almost, he's 12. So okay. my daughter is 15. My son so, is 12, so a 15-year-old yes. and, and, and a 12-year-old. Yes. And uh, uh, you, you've had to take care of them for almost the last 10 years now on your own. Uh, that, that, that's, um, uh, uh, let, let, let's talk about that a bit. What's, what has it been like just being a, a single parent as a man that almost the last 10 years? Okay, so um, it's definitely been challenging um, because, of course, now you have to play the role of a father and maybe play some role of a mother, okay? Um, for instance, there are times when maybe the kids go to school and you, you would tell that at times maybe they need like a mother. So you have to try and play that role. So it's kind of been challenging, honestly, but God has been my help. and. Um, and uh, the, the, the reason why I ask the question is also because I want to be able to find out, has the mom been able to play certain roles in their life all this while? Okay, so um, she hasn't been able to play the role. Um, and the, the begging question actually is, has she been able to play? She hasn't been able to play the role, to be honest. Okay, yes. Let, let's get into it. Yeah. What led to your separation? Okay, um, so um, it was mostly issues around communication. And that stemmed from, you know, um, um, the ability, the inability to come to an alignment in reasoning and in decision making. Okay, so, um, I mean, you look at the person's sense of judgment. Mm -hmm. and you see that is a bit impaired. So of course a spin-off from that is that you're not aligned in the way you're thinking and so you can't come to um, an agreement in anything, in, in most things. So know. at what point do you actually, did you start, uh, at, at, uh, I know at some point you started to notice that there's a pattern, Yes. right? Be before you can categorically say that someone's line of thought and the sense of judgment will not always align with yours. It means that you feel like yours is like a better sense of judgment 
Uh, is it based on principle or universally acceptable norms? Can you give us some examples where you just feel you know, something must be wrong here? Okay, so um, I'll probably just give uh, example that comes to mind now is, uh, I'll say for instance, for the children. For instance, our children didn't start eating until they were three and the boy until he was four. When you say eating, how, yeah, how do you mean? I mean, they were eating proper food. Okay. They were, they were still eating baby food at three and four. So they're going to school and you're packing, you know, feeding bottles for them to school at that age. And that's because she just felt that's what they should be eating at the time. You know, and sometimes in the night she would wake them up and feed them with um, this kind of food, you know, and baby food, even in, at night, you know. So, so th those sort of, that's an example. And, you know, when you flag it, she probably get upset. I'm like, I know what I'm doing. I'm the mother here. You know, that didn't sound okay by any standard yeah. to me. Uh, would you say that uh, this, this was beyond the ordinary in any way? Yes, I think it was beyond the ordinary. In fact, it, it took me aback. I was surprised to see those sort of things. Um, I didn't expect to see those sort of things, of course. And of course, what I try to do as the father is try to address it and say, ah, how about we do it differently? But you know, it was kicked against and even, you know, there was no room for, for reasoning or having a discussion around it. Yeah. And when you noticed uh, other areas, I guess, yes. Yes. where uh, the, the sense of judgment was not appropriate, was not okay, uh, what was your response to that? Okay, so initially, um, the truth is I didn't, I didn't pick up that um, from the beginning. So I just felt it was a bit of some obstinacy or just being set in your ways. So sometimes um, I may use force and sometimes I just left things, you know, let things be. When you Most say time, force, yes. are you talking about brute force or physical force or no no so not physical sometimes i just say look this is the way this thing should be it should not be that way for instance especially when it came to the children for instance when she started doing that at a point i said no this thing must stop you can't keep feeding these children with this kind of food and the things that um involved me i probably most most of the time just so you know what let's just leave it you know but when it involves the children i couldn't bear to just watch them being, you know, um, <laughs> treated like So that. Andy, from what you're describing to me, it yeah. looks like uh, your ex had some kind of psychological issues. Would that be correct? Yes, I would, I would say that. Um, I would say that definitely. It, came, it became apparent to me after a while that there was some psychological issues, which I didn't pick up um, before marriage. OK, so you, are you saying that nothing prepared you for that in terms of, how long did you date for? Uh, so we did it for this very good question, PG. We actually did it for about five months. Okay. Um, and the, you know, um, the, the gathering and the church were at the time just encouraged us, said, look, you guys, uh, you're matured. We know this person, we know you. Just get this thing done and over with, you know. And, but more, more importantly, PG, I think, um, I think also I was a bit more generic in my approach. Um, if I may say here, one of the things I like about Amari and the things, the content I see in Amari is the fact that it helps you to be detailed in the affairs of marriage. Different okay, okay, you're talking about my marriage preparatory the course. The marriage preparatory okay. course, okay. yes, yeah, absolutely. Amari. Yeah. Yes, the Amari course. Yeah. The Amari course helps you to be detailed in many areas that people usually just overlook. And in my own case, I felt, well, if you're born again, you go to church, you, are, you have the fruits of the spirit, you're patient, for instance, or kind, then it's just good to get married. But I have realized that that is definitely not the case. There are issues around um, communication, around finance, around in-laws, so many issues of life that you need to be detailed about and understand where you are where each person is in, in, those, in those places. And that will, of course, form how you move on in your, in your marriage. Now, Andy, how long did it take you to start to actually practically notice that it looks like my partner 
has some psychological imbalance issues. Okay, so um, to be honest, after the second and third year, with, I mean, um, I could tell there was an issue, but I would rationalize it. For instance, we're having a discussion, and in my mind, I would say, is this girl okay? But I would just sort of say, no, Femi, come on, because you're having an argument with your wife and she's not agreeing with you, doesn't mean that she's not okay. Okay, so I rationalized things for a while. And again, I think what I should have also done maybe was to share with somebody else. I kept a lot of things internal and I felt I could handle them um, by myself. And especially because I felt maybe some of the things would expose her. So I felt maybe I was protecting her but actually protecting things in the marriage that was eating the marriage up and wasn't addressed until, of course, it blew out of proportion. So yeah. talking about things blowing out of proportion, yes. at what point did you get to that you started to feel like this is not working and maybe, you know, what really happened? What led to the separation? Okay, so... Um, they actually were by like three phases of that. Okay. But the first one was, um, of course, in the marriage itself, at a point there was no communication at all. And to be honest, PG, sometimes I actually ran away from, I didn't want to have conversations because I knew it was going to lead into either anarchy or uh, uh, misunderstanding. So I avoided. So every uh, kind of communication yeah. ended in Ended a, in an argument. In an and argument. Of con and, yeah. and, um, misunderstanding. Okay, so that was the first stage, and so there was no communication for a very long time. And after a while, she left. Okay. Again, this... She is, just left home. She just the left house. Home. Yeah. I wasn't even in town. You know, she didn't inform me she was leaving. She just took the kids and left. Again, this is a, this is a sense of judgment I was talking about. You know, probably they would have approached differently. And then lastly, uh, even after she left, she left with the kids, and then after one year, she asked me to come and take the kids. And then she now went away for another one year, and nobody knew where she was. She didn't call the kids, she didn't call me. Um, she didn't call anybody. She didn't she call didn't, you, she didn't call the kids. She didn't call the kids. For one year? For one year. Wow. I, so, remember, I remember my daughter on, on her birthday, she, she, she kept reassuring me, she said, Daddy, don't worry, Mommy will call. And she stayed up till like 12. She, she stayed up to midnight. Yes. Yeah, her mom sailed in alcohol. Yeah. And uh, that looked like more of a breaking point for you. Yeah, for me. So where I just you felt... started to feel like maybe she's gone for good. Yeah, I mean, um, also is the is the reasoning behind it. Um, there's there's just this motherly thing that I feel a woman should have towards her kids. I think it's just natural. And in Yoruba, it's called abiyamo. You know, you just feel this belonging to your child. So. To be able to leave your child for a year and not call and not even find out where they are, just sort of something just definitely really wrong. So in the midst of all this, Andy, um, what role did uh, the support system around you played, especially before you got to that point where you knew that this was going off? Uh, did you speak to family? Was there any attempt at counseling or therapy or anything like that? Okay, so, um, so the two support systems that I would address is um, the one in church. So church, so every night, well, um, I should say this, I always, like I said, didn't want to share with people, but I just felt this is family, let's sort it out amongst ourselves. But she believed maybe we needed counseling. And sometimes she would go to church. And every time we went to church, most of the time she would come back crying because the, the counselors will, of course, have a go at her. And then, you know, she comes and I say, look, this is why I don't like counseling. Let's try and resolve this thing that, among ourselves. We didn't have to expose ourselves like that. But, you know, so that was there. But so I was it like the counselors made her realize that she was at fault or she was making a mistake or what? Yes, so um, yes, they, 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 did, they did their best, to be honest. I would, I would say that because, um, PJ, I think the work of a marriage counselor is a very tough one because sometimes even the picture that's painted to the marriage counselor may not be necessarily what is going on at home, you know, and it may not be addressing. So if you have a headache and you're addressing stomach ache, 
there's a problem. So, so yeah, so they tried their best, but I don't think they were getting to the core of the issue. Um, with family, again, I wasn't able to share with them because, again, I, I felt I was protecting her. I didn't want to say the thing she was doing because, I mean, it would sound odd to be like, ah, and how are you coping with this or those sort of things? I didn't want that. But again, I should have, definitely. I, I didn't have to protect the whole thing and then, you know, putting the marriage in the place where it finally found itself in a collapse. Wow. Uh, so the, the, the issues happened. She left. She brought back the kids after a year. She didn't talk to the kids again or yourself. Another whole year. And that was the beginning of the end. Right. All right. So we're going to pick it up from there when we come back from this break. Because I want to know uh, at what point did, did you uh, become... Uh, you know, did you resign to faith in this, in this relationship where you just felt this has come to an end and I need to move on? So please don't go away. Stay with us. I'll be right back with Andy Moyo. Over the last 25 years, I've realized that the principles that govern marriage are as important as the principles that govern life itself. And when we overlook those principles, we make a mess of any kind of relationship that we may get involved with. That's why I wanted to consider being a part of the Amari course. We're going to be looking at the importance of how to manage finance in marriage, emotional readiness, communication in marriage, in-laws and outlaws, third party, big elephant in the room, sex. These are the issues that we addressed in the Amari preparatory course. There's also a marriage enhancement course. So whether you are married, single, separated, newlywed, or you've been married for a long time, the Amari course will expose you to the right principles that will lead to a blissful marital experience. So go ahead and register and be a part of this course. Welcome back. It's a Better Half Show, and we'll be discussing divorce, separation, and remarriage. And I've been talking to Andy Moyo. Uh, Andy Moyo has been married. Uh, he was married for uh, seven years, and he's been separated for the last nine years, going on 10 years. He's been a single father uh, for nine years right now. And he shared his experience about what really transpired in his marriage uh, and all the things that has happened, uh, it bordered more on non-alignment based on uh, a spouse that is a bit psychologically challenged. What do you do when you're dealing with someone in a relationship that is psychologically challenged and um, uh, they, they're not able to reason along with you and communication has broken down uh, uh, and all that? That's what we've been discussing. Now, Andy, um, when you got to the point where you realize that this is there's something wrong here. Something you know something is not just okay, especially when she disappeared or left right. the kids with you for a year. From that point on, how did you start to rationalize things? And at what point did you get to where you feel like we're done? Okay, so. Um my first instinct, actually, when I started noticing that, was to see if I could get help for her, um, see if I could help her, you know, uh, come back. And what I realized was that there, there was resistance to help. And um, being a Christian, I felt the, the first point of call is get spiritual help. But again, we were not aligned in that. She just didn't feel that she needed any help and she wasn't going to get any help. Uh, neither did her, her folks, her parents didn't think, or her family didn't think that you know, she needed um, any help at that point. And at this point, of course, my own parents were beginning to notice this thing, because of course now it's all out, yeah. and they're like, okay, well, <laughs> there should be some middle ground where you would shift, but there was not that, and you know, even with the family, they were not shifting from their position. And it was at that point where it was, it was obvious that, you know, if I went on with this, 
um, there were things that were at stake. And, and first of all, of course, I feel um, my destiny in God was at stake. And I felt that I needed to salvage that. You know, um, was one of the reasons why I felt, okay, you know what, um, this cannot go on. And secondly, I realized that a lot, a lot of the times, especially during the marriage, things were done out of sympathy and, you know, pity. Mm -hmm. and, and I couldn't carry on like that because it's not even for her own good because she wasn't happy. And I was just doing it out of pity. So I needed to take responsibility and say, look, you know what, this is not working. For us, for the children, for everyone, I needed to take that responsibility and say, look, we just need to um, come to um, an end. Okay, so Andy, let's talk about you. In the last nine years or thereabout, you've been a single father. Prior to that, you were in a relationship, a marriage relationship, that was, uh, that was putting you under a lot of pressure. How has it been with you? Uh, how do you describe what you've been through emotionally? And uh, would you say that you, you are healed and you, you, you're better off to get into another relationship? Yes, so, um, yeah, PG, there, there, there's, I mean, it's nine years, so there's been different stages. In the first uh, few months, there was that, um, first that denial, okay, you know what, I'm okay, nothing is wrong. And after a while, of course, I began to feel, um, I mean, the Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone. A man is never wired to be just by himself. So I started feeling the pressure. And of course, when I started taking care of the kids, the role of a woman in the house, of course, was there. And it stretched me a bit because I had I have a day job, you know, and I have to attend to their school, I have to attend to things at home. So it stretched me a bit. So, but I mean, as time also went on, God also gave me wisdom on how to try and balance things out. Of course, it can't be like when a woman is there, but try and balance it out without letting things fall through the cracks too much, you know. Um, so, so the healing process for me, um, to answer your question, has been gradual. So there's that point where I felt, ah, you know, how did I even get here? You know, why did you make this kind of decision? And of course, try to learn more and um, um, glean from the mistakes I made. I think that sort of helped me to, to heal as well. I said, look, you know what? You could have done this and done that and take responsibility and see how you can actually also move on from here. Okay, uh, I, I need to ask you a question about how, what, what kind of questions your kids have been asking and how have you been able to maneuver through that? But before you answer that question, I, I just said that to prepare you, before you yes. answer that question, uh, I, I need you to, uh, to, you know, to talk about what it's been like for you to be single the last nine years as someone who has been married before. I know you said you have healed, you know, and all that. Will you say you are at that point where you, you, you actually want to venture again? Because there has to be a reason why you have refused to venture these last few years. Yes, um, um, to be honest, um, the, the decision to end it was not very easy for me. Um, especially because growing up, I never envisaged I would come to the point. In fact, I remember my mom saying to me that if she had looked at all her children and she had thought maybe by any chance anybody would go through any marriage issue, the last person she would point to was me because of maybe the way I was positioned and the way I probably did my thing. So I never saw it coming. Um, so I, I think for me, I've been able to um, come to a point where I now look at life, of course, differently. I have more information, I have learned a lot of lessons, and I feel like, yes, I can, I can start all over again. Of course, it involves somebody else. I didn't think it was just severing and just moving on it was that easy. It wasn't that easy for me, yes. but I've come to that point and I've been able to make up my mind. Yeah. So what about the kids? What, so the kids, what, yes. What kind of question are they asking and how are you answering those questions? Of course, so the kids, of course, asked me, um, why is mom not here? They ask that question often. And 
and I tell them, um, see, mom is not feeling very well. Um, I don't go into the details of God, of that. People sometimes fall ill. <laughs> so their child like mine will just feel okay. Maybe she's in the hospital. She's not feeling very well. Uh, but we need to pray for mom. So the times, will, of course, many times we will pray for, for her and we just ask God to touch her heart. So that's how I maneuvered around without getting into the details of things. Because again, I also didn't want their mind getting into the details of I didn't I didn't think they were they were ripe for it yet. So would you say that she she hasn't looked back the last few years uh, or, or what kind of contact do you and the kids have with her right now? Okay, so um, in the past three years to be honest she tried now to reach out. Um, to reach out to to me actually and also to the kids. And so when she tried to reach out to me, and she even said, okay, can we consider even maybe coming together? And I asked her some fundamental questions. For instance, what are we doing differently? What are you doing differently from what? You, there were areas we talked about help. Are you willing to get help? There were things you told your family that were not very true. Have you corrected those things? The things that caused division between the two families I mean, are the families talking now? On, on what platform are we going to come back? There are issues about faith that we don't agree on. There are issues about so many things. And there were no answers to that. And I said, <laughs> I mean, clearly you can see that. I mean, so you still want to hold your position and you feel that there can be a reconciliation. And I'm wondering where is that coming from? So that's the first one. For the kids. Uh, so, yes, so I think, um, I don't know if she she was convinced that I was able to hold on this long. And so many times I think she's just surprised. Actually, she said how the kids have grown. Of course, they're doing well by God's grace. And she's just many times really surprised. And so in the past three years, I noticed she's tried to contact them. And I encourage it. Um, even though lately I've sort of tried to manage it. The reason why is because um, I noticed when they have contact with her, two things happen. Number one, uh, it's very emotional for them. So I said to her, if you must come, it must be structured. Let's put some structure around it so that the kids are prepared. So I tell them, you're going to see your mom in three weeks. It's not that you just show up and then you disappear for a long time and they don't know when next you're coming. So let's put some structure into it. The second thing is, um, I noticed that she has some conversations with them in the private. And it seems to sort of sometimes poison their mind. And I just felt, no, that's not healthy for them as well. So I sort of manage the, the outreach I and mean, when she wants to see that that's how I feel I should manage it yeah so lastly Andy what do you think can make you change your mind hmm. that's, it's a very um, it's a very good question it's also a very complicated question because I've actually thought about this and I've actually also asked God about it um, and like I said earlier, I feel marriage is a very, um, it's a very deep, deep concept. And it's just not something you stumble on or you approach by being uh, generic. There's a, there are a lot of intricacies that make marriage work. And if those elements are not there, or what I call the four legs of the table, if they're not there, like the Bible says, if the foundation is faulty, there's just nothing the righteous can do. So is there something that can be done? Yeah, of course, if those four legs can come, if the foundation can be repaired and this alignment, for instance, in thinking, there, there's a platform for reasoning, then, of course, it's, it's even easier for me and probably smarter for me to go back to it as opposed to now starting all over again. It's better for me, it's better for the kids. But when that is not there, then it poses a problem for everyone. And then I then believe I have the responsibility to arrest the issue and make sure and forge ahead the best way that I can. Thank you, Andy. Yes, sir. But before I finally let you go, yes, sir. I just needed to speak to those fundamental, those legs of the, of the table yes. that you spoke about. In what areas do you think those alignments are important? Okay, so um, I feel, first of all, there, is, there has to be what I call a, um, a proximity in paradigm, the paradigm framework. 
what that means is I think core values and reasoning have to be alike. They can't be parallel. If, the, if there's parallel, then there, there's division. And the division, so like you know, is two vision. I mean, people just have two different visions. Then there can't be alignment. So you need to understand how your uh, spouse or the person you want to get married to is thinking. Your thoughts must align. And I believe also there's, there's this thing, such a thing as concession. Sometimes the person is not exactly where you are, you are. But you can adopt that person's thinking. You don't mind. It's not a great departure from where you are. So you concede. That is there. And you can, so in some cases, you find out that even though it's, it's a way, you can compromise. And it's because it's still not too far away. You live where you are. You're not considering this time. You are actually living your own position and you're going to the person's position. So you can compromise. So if there's room for concession, there's room for compromise. I think, yeah, things can still work. But when you realize that those, those elements are not there, you can't reason together, um, I believe the, 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 the strength and the secret of any relationship is the power to resolve. You can't resolve things. You can't align then you're just up for... So, so I, 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 I envisage you're talking about, uh, you know, just being able to align your thoughts, your plans, yes. maybe your belief system, yes. your faith, exactly. uh, how you deal with money, exactly. how you take care of children, exactly. how you relate with people who should be in your circle and who should not be. Um, how do we relate with family? Yes. Yeah. Who holds us accountable and yes. how do we resolve our conflicts? Yes, sir. All right. So, uh, thank you very much, Andy, for sharing your experience with us. Uh, uh, my desire for you is that uh, God will lead you into the fullness of His will for your life and that Amen. you you would enjoy uh, wisdom on how to take the next steps into uh, you know a life of fulfillment and a life of happiness and peace. Uh, thank, thank you, Th thank you, thank, thank you for joining me on the show today. Uh, 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 for for my viewers, I, I needed to understand something from Andy's story uh, that we've seen that uh, sometimes we start out well, we mean well, but two cannot work together except they agree. And when there's a fundamental fault line in the belief system of the other person, whether it's emotional, psychological, or spiritual, uh, it can put an immense, you know, pressure on the relationship to the point that uh, separation may be an inevitable. Now, when a separation happens, the next thing is for us to say, how can we still work things out? Yeah, before we come to a point of necessary ending, if we will ever get there. And we need to be able to identify what are the real uh, points of disagreement. Is this occasioned by our faith or belief system? Is it occasioned uh, by uh, 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 maladjustment, you know, emotionally or psychologically? Or is it like uh, we need to get into a space where people can help us ventilate on this belief system uh, so that, just like Andy was saying, we can get into a bit of uh, compromise, you know, shifting ground, and not shifting ground just because we're pressured into it, but because we know uh, that, that there's some, some uh, benefit in that shift uh, because it's not so far away from where we, we are, uh, where we were and it's not fundamental. So the question I, I want to leave you with is, what are your fundamental values that must align with that of your partner or the person that you, 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 you have a relationship with? Uh, you know, a great relationship with whether it's a marriage or a business partnership uh, kind of relationship, because when you don't pay attention to that, it, will, it has a way of showing up in the future. Two cannot work together except there's an agreement. It's on the base of agreement that we can have uh, our trust, that we can build friendship, that we can go a long way together. Uh, and I needed to understand this also, that when we find ourselves in a relationship where there's a psychological issue, an emotional issue that is really tough, it's always better to slow down, allow the other person to get help before we can go further again. If not, it's going to be wearisome, it's going to be troubling for uh, the two partners 
and the children. And when a partner is not willing to seek help, then we can take a fundamental break uh, until something uh, has been turned around. And I think that's where uh, my guest today has been for a period of time. And I need to salute his courage for holding on the last nine years. Uh, I know it's taken a lot from him. And if you're in the same shoes, I just want to encourage you. Uh, uh, sometimes you need to hold on and, and, and see how you can help the other person before you move on into uh, another relationship. And it's on that note that I also want to use the opportunity to introduce to you, you know, while Andy was speaking, he also spoke about the Americas. He's been a part of the Americas uh, and it has helped to, you know, to shape his perspective. The Americas uh, is available on americas.com. Uh, Americas is a, a marriage preparatory and a marriage enrichment program uh, that I put together a while ago and a lot of couples and intending couples have participated uh, in either of the courses and they, they've been uh, tremendously impacted and, uh, and transformed. So I want to recommend it to you. I need you to go to AmeriCourse.com and be a part of uh, the, either the marriage enrichment if you're married or the marriage preparatory course if you're single. Uh, and until I come your way again on another episode of the Better Half Show, may your marriage and relationships be sweet. Mm -hmm.